Hello and welcome to In Parliament. I'm Sharon Tong. Parliament entered its second day of debate on the President's speech with many members calling for measures to make sure no one falls through the cracks. The first front bench minister to join the debate, Acting Minister for Community Development, Youth and Sports, Chan Chun Singh, says his ministry is working towards better integration across different help agencies to improve social mobility. And this includes investing in more preventive measures such as helping children from at-risk families stay the course in schools. Mr Chan cited himself as an example of an individual who has benefited from such measures. I have benefited from various government scholarships and bursaries, but I have also benefited from the help of the community and individuals like the Tongan Hui Kwan, Gong Wai Siu Pek San Teng, and the Old Reflection Association. As you can see, I was someone from the at-risk group, but I was supported by helping hands from the public, private and people sectors, which I am eternally grateful for. We must continue to grow this partnership for the benefit of many more who may need help. We must continue to pay it forward. And one way the ministry is doing that is by refining the ComCare scheme. It's being made more flexible in tackling potential challenges arising from a deteriorating global economy. For example, families that need more time to get back on their feet will enjoy a longer period of assistance. Minister of State for Community Development, Youth and Sports, Halima Yakub, says family service centres will also get more funding and support to cope with a potential increase in workload. Madam Halima also called for more subsidies to be given to home care and community-based services and in particular better support for caregivers. Increasingly these caregivers are also aging and are in need of medical care themselves and we are exploring a range of solutions to support care at home and in the community. This includes assistive technology and home modification. We will also look into expanding the range of structured caregiver training programs to meet the diverse needs of families. And still on the theme of Singapore's ageing population, Mayor of Northwest District Dr. Teo Ho Pin has urged the government to make Singapore a more elderly-friendly city. This is important as by 2030, one in five Singaporeans will be more than 65 years old. The government can build more elderly studio apartments with existing housing within existing housing estates to facilitate seniors to live near their children when they grow old. In this way, the elderly can have more options to safeguard their financial security and get support from their families. Also focusing his maiden speech on helping high-risk families facing financial difficulties, MP for Tanjung Paga GRC, Dr. Chia Shi Lu, says many families continue to struggle in spite of various assistance schemes available to them. The risk of such schemes, he says, is that families may become entangled in a poverty trap, which succeeding generations will find difficult to get out of. Medical professionals have long recognised that for most illnesses, early and, and aggressive to intervention is often the best way to effect a complete cure, reduce complications, or at the very least, facilitate good long-term control of the condition. I think that some military strategists and business leaders would also espouse a similar philosophy. Similarly, I hope that this government, in all its wisdom, would consider implementing even more targeted, even more aggressive, but yet calibrated measures to assist this group of highly vulnerable families that have fallen on hard times. But as the government strives to refine its social safety net, Minister of State for Trade and Industry Li Yixian has warned against populist policies. He said Singapore must continue to retain its sound fundamental values such as unity, meritocracy and justice to ensure its continued survival and success. Taking lessons from economies like Greece and the US, which introduced social programs they found difficult to pay for, Mr Li says Singapore has to be mindful of the trade-off each policy brings. If we build more roads, we will have fewer parks. If we allow property values to appreciate, it would mean a bigger gap between the existing asset owners and the aspirants. Sir, the nature is full of inherent trade-offs. Each policy has its multifaceted effects. So let us be mindful of them and make the best of it. 
Singapore's housing policies also came up for debate in Parliament today, attracting comments from both PAP and opposition members. MP for Holland Bukit Tima GRC Christopher de Souza says that though housing policies need fine-tuning, the foundation of these policies are still sturdy. He was responding to concerns expressed by non-constituency MP Gerald Giam of the Workers' Party on the public housing situation in Singapore. BTO flats do not solve the immediate housing problem because it takes up to two to three years before the new flat owners get their keys. In the meantime, many are still without a home of their own. While we can agree that these policies need fine-tuning, what I cannot agree with the member is that the foundations of the policy are incorrect. Because however you skin the cat, however you look at it, 80% of Singaporeans live in public housing and 80% of Singaporeans own their own homes. So I beg to defer. I think I was correct to say that we should uh, be very careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And MP for Nisun GRC, Dr Lim Wee Kiak, has called on HDB to return back to its basics with home ownership as the main mission. In addition to reviewing the pricing policy of new HDB flats, he also had these suggestions. Number one, this allowed HDB flat upgrader to, uh, upgraders to private property from retaining their flats for rental, which means they have to sell. Number two, impose additional tax condition on PRs who have invested in HDB flats for rental or for capital gain. Number three, increase HDB housing grant to low-income families, but at the same time, extend the minimum occupancy period to prevent premature cashing out. Minister of State for Defence and Education Lawrence Wong rebutted arguments by some MPs in Parliament that problems faced by Singapore are the result of the government's focus on growth. He stressed that the government has never pursued GDP as an end in itself. Rather, growth has been pursued with a firm commitment to fairness and as the foundation for broader benefits for all. Turning to education, Mr Wong said the government will also continue with the expansion of the university sector especially polytechnic upgraders seeking a degree. We can expect an increase of 1,000 university places, all for Singaporeans, in 2012. Thereafter, there will be an increase of another 1,000 more places over the next few years. And beyond that, the Committee on University Education Pathways, which I chair, is gathering feedback and studying ways to have more university places for Singaporeans. Focusing his arguments on undergraduates in private institutions, MP for Jurong GRC Ang Wei Neng has urged the government to look into increasing subsidies and providing more bursaries for this group. He said this would allow more Singaporeans who embark on continuous education to enjoy similar benefits as local university graduates. We also have full employment or almost full employment. This means that our current job market can sustain significantly higher number of graduates than what the local universities can produce. As Singapore gears itself towards a knowledge-based economy, we will probably need more graduates and not less. The Minister in Charge of Entrepreneurship, Teo Selak, has called for more than just infrastructure and funding support to be given to business owners. He said it was important to improve the administration of funding, grants and loans to SMEs and young companies. Mr Teo said above that, a change in societal attitudes is also needed. The social stigma of a business failure in Singapore can, be sometime, can sometimes be as bad as that of a HIV carrier or ex-convict. So more can and should be done to change these societal attitudes and reversing this risk of us culture. But it's going to take time. This attitudinal change should also start with some of our government agencies. And first-term MP Gan Tian Po also raised concerns of entrepreneurs. He said businesses are facing a severe labour shortage even as foreign worker quotas have been lowered. He urged the Manpower Ministry to review the foreign workers' quota policy and base it on the wages of Singaporean workers instead of the number employed. He also proposed that only companies with local full-time workers with a minimum salary of $1,500 will be eligible to apply for work permits for foreign workers. A higher rate 
ratio can then be extended to an employer whose local full-time workers earn more than $1,500. Doing so will incentivize businesses to upgrade the skill of their Singaporean workers and to invest in technology which enhance productivity in order to attain and justify higher salaries for Singaporean workers. Singaporean workers will get to benefit directly, unlike the present situation, where the punitive policies of increasing workers' labour push out business costs. In this way, neither businesses nor Singaporean workers benefit directly. MP for Momin Kalang GRC, Denise Pua, tackled both Parliament and the special needs community in her debate. She suggested setting up a special education body to represent each major disability group, as well as a task force to provide education and training for the special needs workforce. Ms Pua also urged the government to study if the officers of the elected president, non-constituency MP and nominated member of Parliament are still relevant given the new political environment of a team of elected opposition MPs. I believe there is no need for the ruling party to play the paternal role and artificially inject alternative voices in Parliament or install additional checks on elected representatives of Singaporeans. I therefore urge government to examine if the created officers of NMP, NCMP and EP are still relevant in today's new political environment. If the conditions under which they were introduced are no longer the same, let us have the courage to slay these sacred cows before they become, fat, before they become overgrown and irrelevant. And joining one of nine MPs making their maiden speeches today, Dr. Janil Puticherry has called for ongoing discussion about the adequacy of the ISA safeguards. He said that while it is inappropriate to detain a citizen without trial, he is convinced by the hard logic that the safety and security of Singapore must be paramount. But he wants to know what safeguards are in place to prevent the ISA from being abused. The first term MP also spoke on behalf of single unwed parents parents who are not eligible for childcare leave and are not allowed to apply for HDB flats. The issues I brought up will not affect our GDP, they will not affect our foreign affairs, they will not affect the vast majority of Singaporeans directly. Nevertheless, I urge that we re-examine them. How we deal with them reflects our aspirations for the type of society we want to become. Parliament has been adjourned till tomorrow. Good night.